feels like you know that you're going to have to be back here at 4 o'clock again. <laughs> now, like, you can't wait to go home now. Every moment in the presence of the Lord is a benefit to our own souls. Not so much a benefit to him, a benefit to us. It's good to have you all here. Are there anybody here for the first time? Tittled? That's just in case I forget something. So we can get our hearts settled. So if you can turn with me to Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17, two weeks ago, last week, Pastor Adrian uh, preached, two weeks ago when I preached, I preached on the churches through identity, I almost want to just change this to a title saying, a servant's through identity, a servant's through identity, and I'll, I'm going to uh, read from verse 7 to 10, but before I do that, uh, let me just remind you a little bit about what I said last, the last time I was here. The true church will find her identity in the chief cornerstone. You guys remember that? That's where we find our identity and that's where we build on as a church. The chief cornerstone is described in the scripture as unshakable, unmovable which will be the church's blessing if the church is built on that cornerstone. As we build on that unshakable, unmovable cornerstone, uh, the church itself or himself or herself become immovable and unshakable. So now when you go to Luke, Luke begins to record what I would like to call a servant's through identity from verse 7 to 10, uh, as Jesus, and, and unfortunately this Bible doesn't give the words of Jesus in red like no, most Bibles do these days, where Jesus begins to explain to his disciples, you will read the, 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 first chap, uh, the first verse of that chapter, you will find he said to his disciples. So he was addressing servants of God. He was addressing his disciples. Uh, those that are already, uh, uh, um, should I say, make, made a commitment to follow him, he was addressing them. And explaining to them what it must be, or what it means, to be a disciple, to be a servant. At some stage, as he speaks from verse 1, in fact, Okay, let me, just, let me just go from verse 1 quickly. There's not that many verses, so let me go. He says to his disciples, offenses will certainly come. In other words, you will be offended. But woe to the one through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea than for him to cause one of these little ones to stumble. Be on your guard. If your brother sins, he tells his disciples to rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day and comes back to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. You must forgive him. D difficult words, but those are the words that Jesus gave to his disciples. And here the disciples is now responding because they hear what it really takes to be a disciple, a follower of Christ. And they say, Lord, increase our faith. They probably thought that for us to be able to do what you are saying now, we need more faith. And Jesus, of course, discards that and says to them, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, the Lord said, you will say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it will obey you. So he takes that 
faith to follow, to follow him. Yes, it does take faith, but you have enough faith. Let me explain to you what a disciple really is. And then verse 7, he begins to explain to them. At this stage, they are already realizing that it must be quite a, a task to be a disciple of Christ. But here he comes and he gives them what he believes to be the true uh, uh, disciple. Now, if you, let me see verse 7, eh? which one of you having a servant, uh, Luke 17, eh, guys, Luke 17, verse 7, which one of you having a servant tending sheep or plowing will say to him when he comes in from the field, come at once and sit down to eat? Instead, he will, will he not tell him, prepare something for me to eat, get ready and serve me while I eat and drink, Later you can eat and drink. Will he not say that? Does he thank that servant because he did what was commanded? In the same way when you have done all that you were commanded, you should say, we are worthless servants. We've only done our duty. The word servant in the Greek is doulos. And servant, I would say, is probably an easy translation for doulos. It can also be translated as slave. That word doulos can be translated as slave. Paul understood that. Paul realized that. This is not Paul that wrote Luke. I'm just sort of giving you a, 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 a bit of Paul's theology around that. Because he says in Galatians chapter 6, he says, Because I bear in my body, or on my body, the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, why is he saying that? Because a slave does bear the marks of its master somewhere on his body you would be able to recognize the slave. So Paul is saying, I bear those marks. I'm a slave to Christ. I'm a slave to my, to my master. Customary for slaves to bear the mark of their master. And Paul made no bones about who his master was. We are willing servants of Christ. None of us can say that we were forced to be and forced to be followers of Christ. Willing. Willing servants, willing slaves for Christ. Not compelled, but willing. A servanthood that does not benefit the master. By the way, what I do for Christ, I benefit far more than he does. In fact, he doesn't really benefit from that. You guys understand what I'm trying to say to you? Paul made no bones about that. A servanthood, a slave, uh, uh, um, a slavery that does not benefit the master, but rather benefits the slave. We count it sheer grace that allows us to bear the mark of our Savior. For if you just think about it, and Paul says that in his epistles and, and, and letters and stuff that he wrote to the various churches, with that mark comes redemption. He redeemed us. He paid for us. He paid for our lives, as it were. A mark that declares us righteous. We have a righteous master he makes us righteous as it is. A mark that declares us delivered from the bondage of sin. A mark that brings with it God's grace. A grace that's freely given. A mark that brings with it divine favor. And a mark that brings with it eternal life. 
I don't mind being called a slave for Christ Jesus because of the benefits that it holds for me. So what should be our conduct? Now, I'm, I'm speaking through that portion of Scripture, verse 7 to 10, but you have to read it, of course, from the beginning to see how Jesus is explaining to them uh, 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 the, the kingdom of God and what it is made of, servants that are truly obedient to their master. And so if you read that, you will find that a servant's work or a servant's service, a slave's service will never, ever come to an end. That while we are where we are, we are well, servants, slaves, whatever to him, but our work will never end. The nature of what we do might change over time as the years progress, but we will never have arrived until one day we hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. Until we hear those words, our work is not done. That is the sense that you get from what Jesus explained to his disciples. He comes from the field, he's tired, he has worked. What do the master say? Go and rest. No, the master says, I now need you to bring me my water so I can wash or uh, 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 make me my food because I need to eat. We will never come to an end with our service on this side of the grave. While we are here, we serve. And all the while, we look to our master, understanding our dependence, our total dependence on him. In fact, that's another thing that's been uh, uh, going on in my mind is that when God calls you to a specific task, he calls you not just to the task, but he equips you for that task as well. There's never a time when the Lord will say to you, do this. And you will not have what it takes to do so because he gives you what it takes. I don't know if I've ever said it here, but I always use the analogy of when uh, Moses was called to duty. And when his father-in-law said to Moses, hey, you know what, the work is getting a lot. You need to now begin to, to delegate. There's a scripture in, Bible, in the Bible that says, then God took from the anointing that was on Moses and he placed it on the 70 elders that has been uh, selected to, to help him in his work. So I believe that when the Lord gives you a task, he fully equips you for that task. No matter how big or how uh, 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 humongous it might be, he equips you for that, for that task. So until we hear the words, well done, my good and faithful servant, we continue to serve him. So our independence on him, understanding we are able to serve only because he enables us. There's no way that that service to him is something of ourselves. There is absolutely, he enables us to serve. He gives us the grace to do so. So we cannot act as if it is done by ourselves. And we can now sit back and rest. Because just as one task is finished, another is assigned. There's always something to do for the master. We should also never have the expectation of reward for our service to the master. Because it says here in verse, does he thank, in verse 9, does he thank that servant because he did what was commanded? Almost, if I should rephrase, does he have to thank you because you did what he commanded? Rhetorical as it is. We should never have the expectation of a reward for our service to the master, or even just the acknowledgement for our service to the master. 
We should never have that expectation. He owes us nothing. And we owe him everything. It is his mercy that enables us to serve him. Be it direct service, and I have to add this in, just in, in terms of where our church is. In his church, or be it the ability to wake up every morning and go to work and earn a living. Or should I say earn an income as do Every single thing we do, we owe it to him, the one who enables us. And even in my secular capacity, I should understand that it is in service to the master. If his mercy enables me to do that, to get up every morning and go to work and earn a living or earn a wages or earn whatever I need to sustain my family, through that I should also serve my master. And that service should then be translated into service for him. The Lord has blessed me. I'm able to, to earn whatever that earnings should also serve him and should serve uh, his church as it is. So Jesus is saying, put your master first. He's the one that you need to serve. He's the one that you need to put first. Service is that is then brought to a place of understanding where it's first service as opposed to whatever else I do in terms of my own life. He needs to come first. His pleasure needs to be placed first before ours. His people needs to be placed first before ours. And that I'm not saying, uh, that I got from somebody who said that. One of my commentaries that I, list, that I, that I read, his people needs to be placed first before ours. And I resonate with that, and that's why I'm saying it to you now. His name needs to come before our own name. That is who we are. We are servants of Christ. We are servants in his service. And our only goal is to see the extension of the kingdom of God. Outside of that goal, he might as well come and fetch us. Because our purpose then in this life is not being fulfilled. Because if we are not here for the extension of the kingdom of God, we might as well go home. And be with him. We are called to serve him. And we are called to place him first. In our lives, in the lives of my family, in the lives of whoever, I'm called to place him first. So that, that portion of scripture that Jesus, where he gives the story about the servant coming back from the field, having worked very hard, that is supposed to actually shake them out of their boots in terms of understanding it. Because when he started speaking about, about forgiving your enemies, forgiving those who offend you or whatever, or being easily offended as it is, already they thought that this is far too much. Requiring There's a way where we have this, what is it doing to me? Where do I stand in all of this? Why am I not considered as far as that is concerned? And so Jesus is bringing to them the fact that you should not be considered. You're a slave to the master. You're a servant to the master. 
Uh, there's a portion of scripture somewhere in Paul's writings where he says that if you are a free man, consider yourself a slave once you've come to Christ. If you are a slave, consider yourself a free man once you come to Christ. We have to see ourselves as servants of the Most High God. And our place should be that of humility as it is. We should be humble in our service to Christ as it is. We cannot allow ourselves to have thoughts of superiority to the Master. I will never forget. I was almost awakened to, to this whole armor bearer thing when I was in Kenya. And the pastor's son took my Bible. Before I could grab it out of the car, he took it and he walked with it. And I understood then, okay, that was the culture and I had to allow that, but I understood then that when you have that attitude that there should be an armor bearer, how do you stand in the pulpit? As what? As who? We are servants. Even standing here, all we do is serve the master. We are nothing more than that but servants to the Most High God. So we cannot have those thoughts of superiority. No matter what our title is. We cannot have any expectation of superior rewards or superiority, no matter who we are or what our title is. In fact, at the end of the day, Jesus rounds this up by saying in the same way, verse 10, when you have done all that you were commanded, and of course you are commanded to serve. And if we've not heard the voice of the Savior in terms of our service, then we need to begin to, to look for that voice and begin to see where that voice is so that we can begin to hear and obey his call to service. In the same way, when you have done all that you were commanded, you should say, we are worthless servants. We are worthless servants. We've only done our duty. That is where we need to be. And that's what we should be saying. We should not say, I contribute enough to this church to have these rights and privileges. I contribute enough to the work of the Lord to have these rights and privileges. We cannot do that. And we cannot say that. So here's my thoughts that I want to share with you. On, on Friday, I think I went to... Uh, to the church where um, there's a, a Christian school there and I went to see a Christmas play there from the kids. And as I came in, I was actually late. As I came in, it was 10 o'clock supposed to be, but I came there about 5 past 10, rushing in. And as I rushed in, I heard somebody said, Pastor Mento. So I looked. And it was a pastor that I worked with while I was in Grassy Park. He's not a, a Baptist pastor, but his grandchild goes to that school. And so he then started speaking, but I could see that the tears were in his eyes. And he said to me, I've just, actually putting his phone in his pocket, I've just heard that my grandson, a few days old, passed away. And I was shocked. I didn't know what to say. I didn't know how to say it. I didn't know, uh, how, you know, how to react even with the news. Now, let me tell you, I've been in situations like that already. A child was just born in a hospital, I think at Mitchell's Plain Hospital, and I was called there, and this child, baby child, just born, was in ICU, and the doctors allowed us to go in so that we can go pray for the child because they knew what was going to happen. So I know that these things happen, but just to be confronted like that with it, 
And then the thought came to me, this guy is a pastor in the church, and look at what he has to go through. And then immediately I had to speak to myself, so what? The words came to me. So what if he's a pastor? So what if I'm a pastor? Am I not subject to all the things that happens in this world? How can I place myself in a place where I say, but I do your work, Lord. How can I do that? I have, con I have to continue being that servant. So the Lord spoke to me then already about service to him. He's a servant of God, subjected to something that is almost something that I cannot conceive myself. I mean, I can't, I can't perceive what, uh, uh, what, uh, um, what he's going through. I said to him when, he left, when I left, I looked for him and I said to him, you have actually shocked me with those words, but I know that this will stay with you for a long time. And I will pray for you. Now, I think uh, Vanessa and I, we spoke a little bit, and she knows who that pastor is. But I also remember reading in the news about two weeks ago about a man who had an argument with his wife. And the wife obviously couldn't hold, uh, couldn't uh, uh, take it anymore. She said, I'm going to take a walk. And it was maybe just as things were getting dark and she took a walk. About an hour later, the husband now gets in his bucky, his four by four, whatever, and he goes and looks for her. While driving out, he felt that he was driving over something, but he didn't know what it was because it's dark now. Drive around, look for her, came back, and he found her in the driveway. He had driven over her. Rushed her into, these are true things, eh? Rushed her into the hospital, and the hospital declared her dead. He jumps in his bucky there, goes to, and I think it's somewhere in Secunda or wherever that is, goes to the mine, gets into the lift, took the lift up to the top, got out and jumped. Three kids, orphans, as a result of that. All this happened within the space of two hours. And those kids are now without parents. A husband and wife argued, true story, and it's a, it's, it's, it's a pity that one needs to see these things. And she threatens to leave him. And the picture I get is her standing on the balcony of their house, talking to him at the bottom there, and saying, I will leave you. I can't take this anymore, whatever the case might be. He comes into the house, grabs his, I think it was a, a, a shotgun or whatever it was, I don't know grabs his, uh, uh, his, his firearm, on his way up, comes across his stepdaughter, shoots her, and she dies. And she has a six-year-old girl, and went up and shot his wife, and she's dead. He's now in jail, and he will be appearing soon again. What kind of rights do we have? I mean, I'm, I'm thinking of that six-year-old girl now. What kind of rights do we have in life when we are subjected to these kinds of things happening as it happened to, it can happen to anybody? We have no rights. The only right we have is to call upon the master, call upon the savior, beseech him for mercy as it were. That is our right, yes. But we cannot have these expectations of, of uh, elevated favor simply because of who we are. I've mentioned the, the things that we believe are our, not rights, but our privileges as a result of being servants of the, whole, uh, the, 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 of the Lord Jesus Christ. And those privileges are, we've been redeemed, we've been set free, we are free from bondage. 
We've been given eternal life, as it were. All those are privileges. Or should I say, yes, let's say privileges. But it's not a right. We have no rights as far as that is concerned. And so it's easy for us to say, Lord, you see where I'm at. You understand what I'm doing. I'm completely sold out for you, Lord. How can this happen to me? That kind of attitude is not the attitude of a servant of Christ. The desired attitude is, verse 10, we are worthless servants. We've only done our duty. That is the desired attitude that you and I should have. See him as your master in everything that you do. See him as your master in whatever it is that you find yourself busy with at the moment, your work, school, wherever. See him as your master in everything. And understand that even though he's your master, you cannot expect privileges from your master at this stage. Privileges that sets you above everybody else. We cannot do that. For we are worthless servants that are only doing our duty. You guys are very quiet at the moment. And it tells me that you are shocked just like I am. We are worthless servants only doing our duty. And if you read that verse 10, you will see it maybe in red by you. But those are the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. Worthless servants. What other words are there? Other than worthless? What does it say? Unworthy. What other words do you guys get in your interpretations there? Un unprofitable servants. Of no profit to him. It's a good word. But of profit to ourselves. What other words do you guys have there? Oh, don't, didn't you bring your Bibles? Onverdienstelijk. Unworthy. Ons verdien dit nie. No, no. What, what's the English word for unverdienst? Undeserving. Undeserving. That's who we are. As servants of the Most High God. But I had to mention what that servanthood brings us right in the beginning. Good for nothing, servants. That's why we're so quiet, brother. <laughs> if anything, Friday already, as the Lord spoke to me about what happened there, if anything, I just want you to have that mindset that as we work for Christ, don't look out for the benefits of that year. Because we don't really have any benefits. Or we are not really uh, 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 entitled to any benefits. Yeah. A day will come. And that's why we should have that attitude that we're working not for anything but for that day. When we are in the presence of the almighty God. That should be our attitude. As we do the work of Christ. The other thing is we should also understand that whatever we do. If I call myself a servant in everything that I do, it would have to be service unto our Lord Jesus Christ. It would have to be that. May the Lord bless you guys. Father, we thank you for your grace and for your mercy. We thank you for who you are, my God. We thank you, dear God, that you saw a people lost, lost in their sin and doomed to death. And then you came. And Lord, we pray that as we engage as your church, as servants of the Most High God, 
that, Lord, we will have the attitude of a servant who right now do not deserve anything but need to work for you, need to place you first, need to place everything about you first, my God. And I pray that you would use us to that end. And, Father, as you use us, it's almost... Uh, 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 not necessary to ask, but as you appoint us service, as you give us work to do, that you will equip us for that. And you will give us the grace, dear God, to do that work, irrespective of who we are, where we are, what we are. You are able to give us the grace to serve you. Thank you for your grace, my God. I pray for your mercy for each and every one of us. I pray that the mercy of God will be our portion, even as we engage in service for you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. the Lord. 